Hi, I'm Alan Chappelle. I'm the singer-songwriter of the band Chappelle. I'm here to promote my website, thisischappelle.com, and I hope you find me on Spotify and the other streaming services. And you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a new guest to the show. He is, of course, a very talented musician. He's also a lawyer, so I can't wait to dive into both of his industries. But you know him as Alan Chappelle. We are joined by Alan himself. How are you doing today? Hey, Kurt. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. A good friend of ours, Ken, put me on to your amazing music and your amazing style of music. It's something I haven't listened to in a while, and I appreciate everything that you've done. And I'm glad you have a very vibrant YouTube channel. I'm getting ahead of myself, as I do. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, I like to to come at things from two very... Uh, different directions. So uh, on the one hand, I'm a, I'm a singer songwriter. Uh, I'm still heavily influenced in the eighties and nineties music that I grew up playing. And I try to bring a kind of a new thing onto that where, you know, the, the eighties in particular were very synth oriented. Um, you know, I, I play a little whirly with the band, but, but I've got a violin player who might be the, you know, the best rock and roll violin player out there. Uh, Lorenzo Ponce, uh, a uh, Grammy award winning uh, Lorenza. I am just so happy for uh, uh, for that win. But uh, Lorenza comes at it and she'll play fiddle on a couple of songs, but but she really, really embraces uh, my inner 80s geek and will, uh, you know, uh, use the violin kind of as a synth. And it brings a kind of a unique thing to, I think, to the overall mix. And I'm just grateful to have her involved. Um, so my thing is, I just, I write about things that, I think are important. Sometimes it's just little stories, uh, little stories about people that I may have met along the way. Um, but I also write about, you know, how the the internet is killing us. And I write about <laughs> uh, things going on in Nicaragua, uh, 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 a place that I have a lot of love in my heart for. Um, and, and so uh, it tends to be a little bit of a wide palette. And, and in some ways, um, it's probably difficult to typecast the type of music that I put out because the, the styles tend to change a little bit and, and the subject matter definitely changes a bit. Uh, but what I love about that is, you know, the, the bands that I like are the bands that do a whole bunch of different things and you don't, you'll listen to an album and, and you'll feel some level of connectivity throughout it, but every song is its own unique uh, experience. And that's the, that's what I'm shooting for. Well, that's awesome. Is it safe to say that you're still a practicing lawyer as well, or is that not something you want to talk about during this interview? Oh, no, I'm happy to talk about it. So, there, you know, there was a time where I, I guess I was a little more sheepish about it. But, you know, I, I'm a guy who was, was um, you know, a touring musician up until, uh, you know, the early 1990s. Uh, and then the whole Seattle grunge thing. I'm a keyboard player, man. There was no work for anybody in New York as a keyboard player for a couple of years. Um, so I went and, and, and lived, uh, joined a band in, uh, in Bombay, in India. Lived there for a while and played around with this band and it was an absolute blast. But when that came to an end, I found myself uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I was literally sitting on a couch in Stamford, Connecticut with the, the same cast of characters, you know, I remember drinking beer, watching an episode of that show friends. Yeah. And, 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 you know, not that those things aren't great in their own way, but it, but it really occurred to me that it's like, that's not going to be my life. I made a decision. I moved to New York without a nickel in my pocket and decided that eventually I'd go to law school. It took me a couple of years, but I, I studied uh, mostly human, uh, human rights, and uh, European Union law, and kind of fell over into this thing called, it was called back in the day, new media, I guess it's still digital, digital media, digital marketing stuff, and, and, and got really involved in that world, and then thought, well, uh, what can I do as somebody who's like, you know, technically a lawyer with a human rights background, and I found privacy law, and it turns out that, uh, 
back in then there wasn't a lot of course material on privacy. Um, you know, now they're teaching it in every school, you know, in undergrad, but they weren't doing that then. Turns out that if you wanted to become a privacy pro, the best thing you could have done is studied human rights law. Yeah. Because if you think about it, human rights law is mostly about getting some large entity, we'll call it the United States, uh, and trying to get them to do something that they are not legally compelled to do. Mm-hmm. Privacy law, I- I- at least in the digital world, is trying to get some large entity, uh, we'll call them Google, and trying to get them to do something that they are not legally compelled to do. And mm-hmm. so uh, it's funny because I didn't have a grand plan for all this, uh, but I've managed to carve something out where uh, I really enjoy what I do. Uh, it, I'm able to make a living and it's able to support uh, the creative endeavors. And so for me, I feel very blessed. I find that fascinating. I've had other lawyers on the show in the past and they're comic creators and comic writers specifically, and they've created amazing works in that respect. It's fascinating that you have two different industries and two different professions, and you're, you're very good at both of them, obviously. But how does being a lawyer and how does being a musician work hand in hand with each other? Well, I, I don't know. They're, they're, they're just, they're slightly different sides of the same coin, but, but they're very, there's a lot of similarities. So I, I have this monthly report that I put out to a whole bunch of large, you know, like not Microsoft, but you get the idea like legal teams and, and, um, and I'll throw in musical references and, you know, the one I'm writing right now has a reference to a, an episode of Rick and Morty. Uh, and, and I find that people really vibe off of your ability to be creative because really all I'm doing here is telling a story. I'm fastening a, a narrative that says, OK, this is this is how the world is going to look in three to five years uh, in a very narrow and specific way. And. Heck, that's kind of what you're doing when you're writing a song. In some ways, you're, or you're, maybe you're looking backwards. But even then, you're, you're, you're taking a couple of details and spinning that into some kind of a story uh, that hopefully people will be able to, uh, that people will enjoy. What are your thoughts on the intersection between technology and the music industry, and how do you see it evolving in the future? So it's kind of funny. I, I don't want to overstate my role or the people that I know, but but uh, I got involved with a whole bunch of uh, music folks out in the Bay Area. And those guys ended up with uh, had a lot of contacts with the, the Napster guys. And you remember the Napster guys, man, they were just a bunch of young kids who saw what they thought was an evil empire in the music industry. And and look, I'm not here to to, to like re-argue any of that stuff. I think there was definitely some arguments uh, in favor and, and against the, the old guard of the music industry. And they went and they blew it up. But what they've realized, most of them anyway, is that the thing that's replaced it might be worse. Um, and, and so, you know, we've moved from a almost, you know, um, uh, almost uh, 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 protection money racket uh, thing where at least you're dealing with real people to an algorithm. And, you know, you can't, I like to say, you can't buy the algorithm a bag of weed. <laughs> you can't. So like now we're in a situation where, I, you know, I'm relying on Spotify and Apple and Pandora. And like, I don't know, you know, I, I am, I am, I've been around the block long enough to know that there must be people who are paying them money, whether it's under the table or officially or whatever, and making sure that their music is getting heard. Um, That's just the way it is. Any algorithm can kind of be, uh, uh, can be gamed, however you want to describe that. And and so, you know, as I look at it now, like, I don't know that it's, better. I think it probably isn't. Um, I don't know that it's, you know, there's some things that are kind of wonderful, like the idea that now in, in my, uh, with technology being what it is, I can write an entire song on my, on my MacBook and then, and have everything ready. So I can like bring it into my band and they know exactly what I want and then they can work to make it better, man. That's great. Technology is wonderful. That would have taken, 
you know, taken forever to do. You know, the, the idea that you can then get it and have the ability to have that song heard by millions or hundreds of millions of people around the world um, is, is really, really amazing. Now, I said they have the ability to hear them. Um, you know, I, I probably have a couple of million plays so far, um, you know, but that's not hundreds and hundreds of millions. So you have the ability to be heard and that's kind of cool. The, the byproduct of that though, is that you're so much noise and it's very difficult to break through the clutter. And that gets me back to the, you know, you can't buy the algorithm a bag of weed. Oh, it's a shame. I mean, there's so many good products of weed. I mean, there's so much good products out there that you could consume, whether it's weed or whether it's music. Uh, it just <laughs> depends on how much you want to pay for it. But it's the same for shows like this one. It's the same for interviews, for long form content. Uh, everything is so bite sized nowadays that it's very difficult to really understand or grasp a full message uh, in respects when everyone's attention span is about 30 seconds. It's just crazy of how everything is just short form to the point of almost uh, being irrelevant. Yeah. The, the, uh, the short attention theater uh, uh, has, has definitely, definitely had a, an impact, an impact on all of our brains, but you know, on the other hand, you know, we're able to do this and also get this out to, you know, a, a, any number of people. And that's kind of cool. And, and, you know, uh, I, I still think there's a clear place for these kinds of conversations. There's a number of, you know, uh, there's podcasts out there that go an hour or two that uh, get a, a huge mass following that I, I have friends who have podcasts that all they do is talk about a certain type of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, that they enjoy playing and God bless, man. That's really cool. It is the age of, of technology and geekdom and there's a, a niche and a passion for everyone out there. So, you know, enjoy what you would like to enjoy. That's the main thing. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is, you know, the, the, the one thing that I don't think was there uh, maybe, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago is the ability to be oneself. I think that's it's embraced in a lot more rooms now than maybe it was, you know, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, heck, and I'm not even talking about like uh, discrimination and, and, and hatred. And, and I'm not saying those things still don't exist. I, I'm talking about like my dad had to hide the fact that he was a bebop jazz sax player, oh. he still is, and he's a really good one. Um, but that was something that was hidden from his career. And, and I, I, and I look back on that and I think how lucky I am where like that comes up in regular conversation in, in work for me all the time, almost every day I get somebody saying, so when is your next album coming out or when you're like, and, and people who are just really into that. And so it, it's just wonderful that you don't have to hide anymore. When is your next album and what's its title? So the next album is called the underground music show. And it's, it's all recorded. Uh, I'm, I'm still trying to work through uh, some of the timing to release it, uh, we're working with the label. But, but right now we're looking at probably mid-May. Um, and I'm really excited about it. It's sort of a, uh, it, it's a project like none other. And I guess every, every album that you record is going to be its own unique thing. But this one's a little bit different because this one was written entirely during the pandemic and then even recorded during the pandemic to the point where um, I moved my family out to Sausalito out in the, the Bay Area. Uh, and so I was living out there and writing and I was working with my band who were all based in New York and they would sit in a recording studio and I would pipe in my vocals beforehand uh, via product called, I think Sound Better is what it's called. But, but anyway, I would like pipe in my vocals and my keyboard parts uh, and the band would play along with those. And that's how we rehearsed because we couldn't be in the same room. But also, no, if nobody's singing, everybody can wear a mask back then, social distancing. I was able to I was able to create an album with my band at a time when when most of them were were, were struggling to find work because they're live musicians um, and, and don't have the benefit of of, of the, the career that I have to, to fall back on. Um, so we, we recorded, and I say this and I, I laugh a little bit, we recorded 27 songs. Wow. 
um, over the course of four days where they were sitting in a recording studio in Brooklyn. And um, we've sort of weaned that down. It's, it's now about 13 songs. I've got a bunch of, I, I guess I would call them B-sides. I don't even know if that's a, like a term anymore, but, but I got a bunch of B-sides that will, once we, once we get rolling with this, we'll start releasing after we've done the, the, the full album, uh, you know, in May or June. Uh, so there's a lot of great stuff. Uh, some of them I, I think are, are single worthy, but some of them are, are not. And, and I, I don't mean that as a knock. I mean, it as the, you know, they're, they're niche. They're, they're things that like, you know, it's a very unique song about a very specific time. And we've got a, I, I wrote a song about the day uh, we asked uh, my cousin or actually my, my nephew, uh, little Harry to drive us around Nicaragua uh, 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 which sounds like it's a good idea, except for, uh, Harry, Harry was, uh, he, he, he was seven at the time. Um, <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time, but there's a song about that. Now, I, I, I don't know if that counts as, you know, mainstream, a mainstream idea. You know, I know David Byrne for a while was playing around with like Latin American folk music. Um, so maybe, Maybe it catches fire with with David. I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll send it to him. Hmm. But but uh, I'm really excited about the album as a whole. No, it sounds amazing, and another plus for using technology to your advantage. So the fact that you could do this type of remote session and get the band together in a digital space to actually put together this amazing CD. Do they even do CDs these days <laughs> or is it just a, a playlist? I sell them at shows. So I, I put out some CDs and I've got some radio stations who, uh, who, who like to, you know, like to get the old school CD. So I, 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 I'll have some, but yeah, it's funny. I don't even know what to call the thing anymore, but, I, and I, I tend to stay very true. Maybe this is too old school, but I try to stay true to the, there's an idea of putting a CD out that that's a complete thought that that somehow is greater than the individual songs and and it doesn't have to be some like huge theme album it can just be something as simple as like no the this group of songs represents what this group of you know five musicians was really feeling at a particular point in time it was a blast to record <laughs> Because of the pandemic, is that the general theme of this actual thing, or are there so are there too many themes to kind of list for this the underground music show? The theme of the underground music show was definitely pandemic related. Just the idea. We got drinks, you got drugs, and religion and video games. And I think I found a better way. Welcome to the underground music show. You know, so th there's definitely a, a the pandemic definitely is a is a regular theme. I try not to make it too much of a downer um but and i i try to find ways to spin that into hope so what i think is going to be the first signal on the album is a song called when the music plays again and i wrote it during a time when there was almost no live music anywhere and and you, you know you, you know there are people in 2020 2021 that went through much much worse things and so i don't want to compare what i was going through to anybody else's deal but but i will say as a musician you you do start to get kind of depressed when you don't have an avenue to play out and and it impacts your ability to write because if you're not feeling a certain way if you don't feel like that that somebody is going to be able to hear this song soon it, 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 it kind of, I don't know, harshes your mellow for the whole process. It's just not, it doesn't feel the same. And so what I was trying to do was to try to try to live off of the dream of when the music plays again. And that was really the, the whole, uh, you know, the, the, the whole idea behind the album. Does it have similar vibes to American Pie then? You know, that particular song definitely has a little bit of Laurel Canyon in it. I, I will say that. Um, yeah, I, I think so. You know, it, it, it definitely evokes a certain time. I'd like to think it's, it's modern enough, but, uh, but definitely evokes a certain time. And, and there's a couple of songs that, that, you know, we almost take on a, a, a folk bluegrass feel. Um, and that's sort of what I'm saying. The band tends to skip around a little bit in terms of genre. So we've already said, you know, uh, uh, underground music show is almost a straight ahead rocker. Uh, you've got the little Harry song, which is a la clear <laughs> Latin American folk song, 
vibe. Uh, I can't wait till the the Mothers Against Drunk Driving come after me for that whole <laughs> song, but that's a different thing. Um, I've got indie rock songs, which are you know, uh, which which are you know, fun and catchy, um, but but probably a little bit more adult, grown up themed. Um, j- just from the perspective of like, I'm not 20 anymore, man. So, like you know, so the theme of this song is is you know, I used to say this would never be me. Um, so anyway, the, the, the album jumps around a bit, um, and, and that, that's, that's deliberate. Um, I, I, I think that's, I see that as a strength. Well, it gives a variety of, of music. It's almost as if you, you need that break instead of something so consistent that you're just known for one single style. The fact that you have versatility in the different genres adds value to the person listening to it. And maybe they'll find a genre that they've never thought of listening to and you've now set them on that particular path. One of my favorite two bands are uh, maybe three, The Smiths, The Cure, and Talking Heads. And the thing that they all have in common is that they bounced around pretty heavily in genres. Like The Smiths were all over the place. But there was something about, uh, there was something about Johnny Marr's guitar and Morrissey's voice that like, it was clearly from note one, it's The Smiths song. The Cure, a little bit, like he, he had a consistency in the drums and his voice is sort of sort of one in a million, Roberts. Um, and, and then the same with the Talking Heads. They, they bounced around a bit. I mean, they definitely borrowed pretty heavily from a Motown thing and then took that, blew it up, made it their own. But they moved a bit in terms of genres, too, and, and, and in the best possible way. It's super cool. And then you have masters like Bowie going everywhere. And, you know, that's just a whole other stratosphere in itself yeah and you, you don't want to imitate but boy I, you know if i die on the hill of evoking you know bowie <laughs> david Byrne, you know johnny marr i'm gonna die on that that's okay hey sounds good to me <laughs> that, those are good good mentors to uh, borrow from can you name one song from each decade from starting with the 80s that inspires you as a creative person and that people should listen to there's a number of songs off of kiss me three by the cure Mm. um uh the way you were um half of uh the uh half of louder than bombs the back half of louder than bombs every single song on there it just moves me so that's probably my 80s if i had to go 90s uh you know, I, I, I thought one not for Octung Baby. I know that probably straddles the line a little bit um, and, and uh, would probably be the one. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the thing about, and then, then the, you know, that entire Gin Blossoms album, and I'm just so glad to have been able to have toured with them. Um, uh, but the, and I remember listening to that, you know, uh, uh, years ago and that that entire album man that that that's the kind of stuff that made me like really really wanna uh, uh want to explore being an artist and then if you're gonna ask me 2000s you know it's funny because like I love these guys and I I am I sound nothing like them I try to be like them I try to be as cool as them I just I can't uh Nutri milk hotel oh yeah that beyond that that air airplanes uh uh album uh is still uh by the way my wife hates it <laughs> doesn't like his voice <laughs> i i love it there's something about the urgency about what he was doing man that guy was living you know whatever he was going through and i've heard conflicting things about you know what, what exactly was going on for him but but uh, that's almost beside the point because he's just so brilliant that's awesome. uh, yeah. What's the difference between being on tour and then being in a, a set date and time at, at say your local pub when you're playing music? The the tour thing is a lot of fun because you, you inevitably, you know, I, I I'm often the, the opener that nobody in the audience has heard of before. And so, but there's something really cool about, walking into a room and knowing that like, all right, these 500 people haven't heard it. And I know at the end of it, they're going to end up singing along with a couple of my songs. 
And so the, the, the art of like winning over an audience like that to me is just a, an absolute blast. The, 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 the regular gig at the local pub can be a ton of fun as well um, because there, you know, th th then it's a slightly different game. You're not playing, you know, your best dozen songs. You, you're, you're actually trying to bring new songs in or get, because people have heard you before. And so then the, the deal is like, well, what spin can you put on this song or that song? So as to, you know, to get the audience really uh, uh, to keep them engaged. And so, uh, you know, I mean, it's a, I don't know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, sometimes I like tequila. Sometimes I like wine. Sometimes I like beer. They're all pretty good. Um, they're just a little different. Interesting. Not being in the industry myself, it's fascinating to understand and hear you, you speak of your joy of being a singer and writer and a musician in itself. So I, I love seeing the excitement in someone's eyes and hearing it in their voice as to what they're really truly passionate about. And I don't think a lot of people are able to say that they've done something that they're truly passionate about. Uh, and so I'm glad I can have a guest like yourself on the show. Well, thanks. And, you know, it's, I, I feel very fortunate that I've, you know, I, I've been, I've been lucky to have come across some wonderful people who opened my eyes to uh, how beautiful the world is. I've got my wife, uh, I've got my dad, I've got uh, Jerry Harrison, uh, who, who's become a, a, a close friend and mentor, but, but, and, and then another, you know, two dozen people who, who really, including my, merely my entire band, um, you know, just people who are, uh, I, I'm mad respect for, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but really the, the, the cool, the coolest thing is, is that they, they invite me to think a little bit different and to, to, to see the opportunity when it's very easy to just shut, shut yourself off from it. So then what sets your music apart from say others in the industry? It's a great question. I, I think, you know, for me, uh, I, I try to do my own unique quirky thing that, that, uh, that I don't think others do. I mean, uh, uh, people have their own like thing and, and I, I guess I have my thing. It's, it's a, it's a really good question. I don't know. I have a great answer for, I think, I think what I do that, that uh, not everybody does, we'll just put it that way is, you know, the, the music world is often about like, you know, I'm 18 and I'm taking on the world. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm pining over, you know, this woman or this man. Um, and, and I tend to write about things from more the perspective of somebody in their thirties or forties or older than somebody in their, you know, twenties. And, and so with that, you know, so when I write a, a love song, it's a grown up love song. It's a song about, you know, for me about two friends who actually were boyfriend and girlfriend in high school and then went off. Uh, after high school and and just got out of each other's lives for 20 years and then found each other again. Um, Cause to me, that's, that's a really interesting story. I don't know that that's the story that gets, you know, that, that gets a, a, as much play. Uh, and and I, I would imagine, you know, if I was 18, maybe, maybe that wouldn't be the, <laughs> the thing that I'd want to listen to, but, 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 you know, Holy crow. That's what I want to be listening to now. I want to have stuff that means something to my life. And, and, you know, if I have one regret about, you know, we call this thing, the music industry, whatever that is, uh, if I have one regret, it, it, it's still based a little too much on nostalgia. Um, and, and, and some of that is just people don't have enough time for music discovery. And, and that's just the reality. It's not, you know, this is an evil algorithm, you know, rant <laughs> again. Right. I'm just saying people don't have as much time for music discovery. And, and, and as a result, you know, most people, you know, by the time they hit 25 or maybe 30, if they're really, really lucky, you know, 40, you know, they, they're really not, they're focused on the music that made them feel a certain way when they were 18. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not hating on that at all it's something really cool about that um I, I i just wish that that there was a way to make room uh for stuff that gets you thinking about where you are now uh the good and the bad uh and not you know where we were uh back when 
communal studio environments. We kind of touched on that earlier in the pandemic, but I don't know if you want to go into that. I have a philosophy about recording. There's no wrong way to do it. I mean, look at Rick Rubin. I mean, he'll, you know, he, he, uh, embraces the the quirks of whoever he's working with and like you know we'll go up and, and record an album on the moon if, that, if that's what he thinks the, the artist needs to get the best album out so there's no wrong way to do it but for me uh and this is a, this is a, a byproduct of living in new york city i try to get my band out of new york city when we record so that you know so we've done the power station new england which is sort of almost in rhode island in connecticut kind of on the border there. We've done that place. We've done Dreamland, which is in upstate New York uh, a couple of times. And, and both of those are really fantastic studios, but, but it's almost besides the point. I mean, those are great studios and we love recording there. But for me, I, we rent a house and we stay up there for a week. And that way, uh, selfishly, uh, I get everybody's attention because if you're commuting in every day, into a studio in New York City, you are dealing with whatever New York City has to give you. And 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 every bit of focus that's on New York City is not focused on being with your band and enjoying their company. And that's one thing I insist upon is we do communal dinners, we hang out. The other thing is selfishly, I've got this wonderful, talented band who've been playing for, you know, for 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 many, many years. Uh, some of the stories around those dinners. Uh, by the way, I'm like under uh, under the cone of silence on them. I can't share names, but but I can tell you, uh, these cats have been through a lot, <laughs> and and they're all funny and they're endearing. And and so every time I I record with these guys, I get the benefit of 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 loving them more of, because I I get to know them a little bit better. And I, I would hope that that would that would uh, you know uh, plant itself or or influence. The music, but I, I almost don't care because selfishly the vibe is so nice. So th that's what we, I usually try to do. I mean, everybody's got to do what works for them, and not everybody can can necessarily afford to like you know take everybody and root up. But I will tell you this, you know, every single one of those great albums that you like, particularly in the seventies and eighties, or were re mostly we recorded in one of two ways. They were mostly recorded by bands who like literally lived in the studio, you know, for, for a month or two, wrote all their things, spent time with each other, got stoned together, uh, hung together, told stories together, cheated on their spouses together, uh, sometimes with, uh, of course, Fleetwood Mac has its own, its own chapter in the Hall of Fame. Um, but but, but I, I guess my point being, though, like, that's how a good album uh, used to be made. The, the other way, by the way, is like you get the wrecking crew in, uh, mm -hmm. and you, you have like a basic thing and then you just get the best, you know, the best damn rhythm section in the world. I like to think I've got the benefit of both because we get away and my, my rhythm section is as good as it gets. Nice. <laughs> awesome. You know, I'm curious about your, your band that you've worked with all these years here. How did you meet them and what inspired them to continue to work with you through these many decades? That's a good question. So I, I met Ann Klein, the guitarist, on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. So I was just finishing up recording an album with Jerry Harrison out west. And so he had opened up his Rolodex uh, for, for musicians to play on the album. But most of, most of those guys were Bay Area or, or at least West Coast guys. A couple of them, I think, were from L.A. Um, and so that really wasn't practical to try to start a band in New York with a bunch of people who live elsewhere. So I, I met Ann Klein through Craigslist. You know, uh, Craigslist, I don't know if it's still a, like, I, I know Craigslist is still there. I don't know how big a deal that is in terms of finding new musicians. But like, you know, ever since the Village Voice went away, Craigslist was sort of the way. And, you, and you, it's a little hit or miss. You meet a couple of people, you have a cup of coffee, you listen to their stuff, you can't check out their vibe. Well, instantly I knew Anne's mad talented. She's a great person to work with and just a, a really kind person. Um, and then uh, and then little by little, I brought in some other people and then rotated a bit and landed with, uh, you know, just through friends, uh, but, but friends of who are professional musicians and not like friends who... You know, I don't know, you just sort of meet along the way. So we, we've got, you know, Malcolm Gold, who's uh, on bass and mad talented guy. Uh, Rodney Howard, 
Uh, he played, uh, he's played on most of my albums. I had uh, Doug Yowell uh, play on uh, one of them because Rodney was out on tour. Uh, Lorenza Ponce is playing uh, the violin. And I've had, uh, she didn't play much on this last album, but I, for years I had Ali Kulata, who is a, a fin- phenomenal band leader in her own, doing kind of a, 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 a ska type of a, a, a vibe. Um, uh, and uh, her band is just fantastic. And they've been touring like crazy. I'm really happy for her. Um, but but uh, it, it's a great band. They're really nice people. I guess the term used in music circles is they're all a good a good hang. And uh, and you really have to have that because you're you're going to be really close with these with these folks. And then I think I said Lorenza. I talked about her earlier, but Lorenza Ponce on the violin is is just so mad talented. And and so why do they keep playing with me? So it's a, it's a really good question. I, I think, you know, what what I offer, I, I think, is that you know, you know, the indie musician usually doesn't pay the same rate as you know uh you know all the all the uber professionals these guys are also touring with the joe jacksons of the world i guess um but uh uh but by the same token i think these guys have just sort of appreciated that uh, i'm very serious about what i do um i come in with a point of view but also uh so that it it tells them no I, i want this room painted red uh so then the discussion isn't about what color the room is but it's about like what shade of red uh, and most really talented musicians would rather uh, all else being equal, be provided with a certain amount of guidance uh, about what, what the artist wants. And I think I'm, I'm pretty good at that. Um, the, the other thing is, is I, I, I try to keep things open and be open-minded because every single album, there's a bunch of places where one or more of the band just blows my mind on something with an idea you know, there's a song called uh, uh, "Will." It's called "Grow Old with Me," and it's one of the more uh, it's one of the more bluegrassy, you know, folk type songs. It starts on piano. And it's almost like a three piece vibe, and then yeah, the violin comes in. And Anne Klein, bless her heart, uh, came in at the end of the song with a really, really cool like groove and we were trying to make it into like a like like you know what would a cool bl- uh, bluegrass band do at the end of one of these songs and i i, I realized that like no i, I want to keep this a three-minute song i think there's something nice about that uh but that little riff that she did i ended up finding a place for it right in the smack in the middle of the song with the exact point where it needed it and so had I not been open to Anne's idea of kind of jamming it out a little bit, we never would have gotten that cool little nugget. And it's really the, the you know, life is about those cool little nuggets, whether it's a, a, a throwaway lyric that, that, that touches somebody's heart uh, or about, you know, a really cool guitar lick that every time I hear it, it makes me smile. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? <laughs> Well, I think that, uh, so th- th- this may, th- I-, I don't know if this is what you're going for. I'm just going to go with it. Cause I think it's funny. Uh, I was a senior in high school and the school decided that they wanted to doubly enforce their dress code. And, uh, and so we sort of rebelled and we, we were a pretty nice class. Like we weren't really weren't cause it a lot of trouble. And, but we, we really dug in our, our, our heels on this one thing. And so myself and a couple of my fellow classmates got together and started talking with people. And we said, listen, I know this really isn't our style, but like, let's just do a walkout and, and let's see what happens. And, and being able to, and, and being able to then communicate to the school clearly, like, look guys, you don't want this problem any more than we do. We're not here to burn down the school. We're not here to, but we're going to make your life more difficult. And so ultimately for you, you know, uh, Mr. Vice Principal, I think it was the Dean that we were talking to. uh, Ultimately for him, the decision is like, is it worth it to you? And, and, and that's probably the first time where I thought maybe maybe there's a thing in this whole law <laughs> as a career that, that, that might, that might be, you know, might be something I want to look into. 
Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Well, I, I think that for me, uh, my dad gave me some advice. And he said, so there was a time where uh, I felt like I had to give up music. And, and, and some of that was just practical because I was working a 70 hour a week job and, and going to law school at night uh, uh, pretty much full time. And so there just wasn't a lot of room to play. And I, I wasn't writing. I wasn't really. And I, I kind of resigned myself a little bit to move into the next thing. And uh, a good friend of mine, uh, this guy named Kevin, uh, he said, look, I, I know you don't have any time but you're talented and we like hanging with you. Just come sing backups. And if you can't make it for a show or you can't make it for a practice, nobody's going to give you a hard time. Just go and do it. And, and, uh, and I was originally a little reluctant because I thought, you know what, I'm turning a chapter in my life. And, and, and my dad took me aside and he's like, I'm sorry, I'm just not understanding. You, you've been playing since you were three. It's, it's the only thing, you've wanted to talk to me about consistently for your entire life. And now you're telling me you don't want to do it. Is that really true? And I'm like, well, I, I just don't have the time. And he's like, but you like playing, right? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, man, if you like playing, find a way to play. I don't know if that's the best advice or the second best advice, but that's some pretty good advice. I like that. That's good. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I think I'm fortunate in that it's a pretty long list, uh, but I've already talked about my dad. So I'm going to go in a little different direction here. I'll say uh, Jerry Harrison uh, has had really changed my life in, in a whole bunch of ways. Um, and I won't get into the specifics of what, what he did for me. I, I'll just say this. I, I often will call Jerry uh, the Wizard of Oz. And, and, and I, the reason I do that, and it's, it's half in jest, but, but Jerry has a superpower. And that superpower is that he gets you to believe you can do something, even if going in, you didn't think you could do it. And that's a gift. And I've watched him do that with person after person after person. Now he did it for me and I'm grateful. Um, but man, can you imagine that you've spent most of your life figuring out how to make other people better? What a gift. From a professional standpoint, you are a successful lawyer as well as a musician. You have done many things in your life and I'm sure you'll continue to do many amazing things in your life, especially with your newest playlist, CD, whatever they call it these days, uh, coming up very soon, which I can't wait to listen to and hear. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, look, I'm, I'm grateful. I, 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 you know, I, I think that I define success that I, I have the freedom that more often than not, I, I get to do what I want. And, and so that, that to me is successful. I've got a number of people, uh, including my wife and my four-year-old daughter, Rose, um, I, I, a number of others in my family who love me and who support me and who accept me. And I think that's another measure of success. So yeah, I, 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 I think of myself as a pretty fortunate and successful person. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, so uh, I, I've had so many times where I have made an absolute jackass out of myself that I'm sort of immune to it. And so, um, you know, I, I, I've had times on the stage, particularly when I was younger and, and probably not as disciplined, that like you would hit not just wrong notes, but like, you know, you'd have like the Bobby Brady puberty thing happen where you were just, your voice is just all over the place. And, uh, and to the point where an entire room full of schoolmates are laughing. Um, and, and, and you're getting talked about in that context 
for what seemed like forever. It probably was only a couple of days, but man, it felt like months and years. But the thing is, is that I, I, I've learned that no matter how much I screw something up, um, tomorrow's another day. And that the people who love me, even some of those who might make fun of me as they watch me screw up, uh, the people who love me are still there to support me. Um, and so I, I had a, a gig uh, not too long ago down in um, uh, down in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was a great, I really enjoyed my time there, uh, but I was sick. And, and, and it was one of those colds that I just couldn't get the congestion out of me. And uh, as I took the stage, it, I, it really wasn't entirely clear that I was going to be able to sing. Mm. And now this is a room, they, they had like 750 people in this room. It was a pretty big, pretty big place. And like this would have, and, you know, I, I, I felt like, well, if this is how it has to go down, this is how it has to go down. But I'm going to go down doing the best version that I can give right now. Um, and, you know, I, I feel pretty lucky. The one, the one thing I did do is I, I took a shot of <laughs> took a shot of tequila right before I went on the stage. And that that did open things up a little bit. But I, I was at like 60 percent of my voice. And so the thing that I rely on, the thing that I take for granted was not going to be there. And um, I feel lucky in that I, I, I realized that, like, if I fail, I fail and you will deal with that tomorrow. Um, but when you remove that from your mind and you just try to live in the moment that is now, uh, you know, I got through it. I got a lot of great feedback. I sold a whole bunch of CDs. Um, eh, it all worked out and I, and I lived to tell about it. Yeah. Tequila and me have a bad history, so we, <laughs> we won't go there. That And, and Jagger, oh gosh, that, that's a whole other story. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a musician, lawyer, or something creative. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you looking up to you, maybe you're going to inspire them on a creative path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Oh, there's really only one answer there is that you got to do what you think is good and you can't listen to anybody else. You can take feedback. You can take some criticism. Um, you can find people who you trust and, and those people you might listen to a little bit more, but at the end of the day, you got to do what you believe and not listen to anybody else. Um, and that's the only way to do it. The, the, the thing that I've learned is that most people, um, when they judge you or when they criticize you, they aren't usually talking about you. They're talking about themselves. And you got to keep that in mind. I get great feedback, particularly from my wife, who is not a musician, nor is she a lawyer, uh, but she calls me on my BS all the time. Um, I don't say like I don't. I, I don't want anybody to think that that there aren't really good people who you should listen to. But at the end of the day, particularly in a creative capacity, it's on you, man. Go make it happen. If your life was a music CD, what would its title be? And what would its genre be? I think the genre would be in somewhere in the, the 80s and 90s thing. The title would be uh, The Shut Up Cracker. How about that? Okay. It's a new one. I'll take it. <laughs> I don't know if I stick the landing on that one, but we'll go with it. Well, Alan, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Well, Kurt, thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is your amazing music and anything else you would like to promote? Well, thank you very much. I've got a wonderful website at This Is Chappelle. I think you've got it down there. This is Chappelle.com. You can find me on Spotify. Apparently, you have to hunt and peck a little bit. There's this comedian who's got a similar last name as me. And apparently, in the Google searches and the Spotify searches, I get buried a little bit. But if you look, you can find me, C-H-A-P-E-L-L, -L, on Spotify, on Apple, on Pandora. And you know the thing that I would really love it if you did is don't just visit it, follow, 
follow me on all those media because that will tell the algorithm that there are more people out there who dig the music. And uh, if you can do that for me, I would be grateful. They should also leave a comment as well. Absolutely. On the YouTube channel. You should also, uh, you know, listen, listen to more two geeks talking. <laughs> I'll take that plug. <laughs> Absolutely. These are fun. I, I, Checked out a couple of your things and I thought they're really great conversations. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I like a musician. Uh, I live in my own bubble as an interviewer. So, you know, it's great to get feedback like this. I appreciate it. Well, again, thank you, Alan. I appreciate the interview. And that ends this particular episode, as I mentioned. But you can find this interview and 1200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking. Dot com. That's T-W-O. Website's going through a complete rebuild. So go to our YouTube channel. That is definitely always updated because I am only one person. That's YouTube.com forward slash T-G-T Media. The podcast is back. Search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking. <laughs>